Professor, what uh, would you like to comment on the DVD or go back and start a little sooner? Please. Well, uh, if you can't hear him, what is your No, name? well, I feel that I should say like the Virginia Slims advertisement, Baby You sure come a long way in this film from when I started teaching about Brazil when they featured Carmen Miranda and, you know, Fred Astaire and that, and flying down to Rio. That was all that you heard about Brazil. I mean, the, we have never taken Brazil very seriously, and uh, it's a rather surprising event that it appears as big as it is. One of the things I would like to comment on that annoyed me about the movie, there were no black faces in the movie. Uh, and Brazil is, is very much a multiracial society, very much in which the black community plays an important role, even though it's also uh, the lower income group. Uh, many of the people of color have succeeded in, in very important positions in Brazil at the present moment. And I was struck by the fact that all the commentators and everybody that you saw in this film were white and there were no members of the black community in this. That would be the first thing. Uh, what do you want me, shall I do the history or, or? Yeah, I think it would be very useful to sort of, uh, why is Brazil, why do they speak Portuguese in Brazil and Spanish every other place in South America? Sort of starting from there. Okay. All right, have you gotten, you got about three hours and then and I'll, I'll No, no, 10 minutes. 10 minutes, all right. Well, uh, let me see. First thing, you know, most of Brazil lies east of New York. If you draw a line straight down from New York, you imagine you'll find South America, but you won't. It, because South America is east of that uh, a line and therefore much more closer to Portugal than than you imagine. That's number one. And number two, I have to say that two things about Brazil that, that you are taken for granted. One that most Brazilians believe. One is that God is a Brazilian. That is a taken fact. That they don't argue with anybody, but every time they get a crisis and they overcome it, they say God is a Brazilian, and everybody knows that. And number two is that there is no sin below the equator. And, and Brazil just borders on the top of that business of being in the equator business, so they're, they're very safe on that. that. That's the way you start any study of Brazil. Um, uh, I. Uh, and personally involved in Brazil. I was married to a Brazilian, and I uh, did my university work at the university in Sao Paulo in Brazil, so that I feel very closely aligned with the country, and uh, sometimes I'm not critical enough, and I'm willing to take my lumps for that, and uh, we'll, we'll share them with you. Uh, about the uh, history of it, why is Brazil speak? Why does Brazil speak Portuguese? Well, in 1494, when the Pope divided up the world into Spain, half Spain, half Portugal, he drew a line north to south, and that line, uh, the outer edge of it, just clipped Brazil, so that there's a little piece of it that sticks out, and the Pope said that part can go to Portugal. All the rest goes to Spain because uh, after Columbus's discovery, uh, the Pope had that sort of power. That sort of makes you think how you know arrogant uh, people are in dividing up the world. Well, this whole part of Portugal, the same part of Brazil, which was Portuguese, because there there had been some discoveries before, and the, and the Portuguese knew that Brazil existed, so that they claimed the outer edge. The outer edge of this line came through the mouth of the Amazon and comes out at Sao Paulo. But 
it was that that was enough to give the Portuguese what they wanted in the way of a of a land mass on on the uh, on the continent. Now the Portuguese certainly didn't have the size and the power of Spain, and and Columbus went on, and Cortes and and Pizarro, all of those brought in the gold and silver of the New World, and Brazil had none of that. Brazil had no gold, Brazil had no silver, and so it was left alone and nobody bothered it because uh, they, did, they thought it was a worthless piece of land. Of course, this was not true. Br gold will be discovered about 1750, but it's 200 years later than the Spanish and the gold. Um, what, what uh, Brazil went on to, uh, Portugal rather, went on to uh, throw out any foreign attempts at taking over. The Dutch, for example, took over 1,200 miles of Dutch, of Brazilian territory and would have held on to it and turned that country into a type of, what was it, the, uh, in, in, in Southeast Asia. Uh, where the Dutch were so strong. Indonesia. Indonesia, yeah. yeah. The uh, type of Indonesia. But the uh, Brazilians threw out the Dutch in, in 1640, 1650, and, and as a result, the Brazilians had a sense of nationalism that didn't exist in the other countries of Latin America. They had thrown out the Dutch and they were in, in charge of their own territory. And then the most amazing event in Brazilian history, which marked it apart from the other Latin American countries, was the fact that when Napoleon conquered Europe, only one king got away from him, and that was João VI of Portugal. He was the one man who took the, when Napoleon approached and was about to conquer Portugal, he took the whole Brazilian court, the king, the queen, the navy, everything, and fled to Brazil. Of course, the British Navy was there to, to escort them across and charge them a per diem for the, for the boats that they used. But they got to Brazil in time and, and set up the Portuguese Empire in Brazil from about, let me see, it was 1808 to 1822. For about all that time, Portugal was governed from Brazil, and Napoleon, when he was Elvis, said there was one king that got away from me, and that was João VI of Portugal, who escaped me and, and got back. Now remember, this was a Portuguese king, and they were intermarried with the Habsburg Empire of Europe, so that they have the, all the traditions of Europe. And when they, brought, when they came to the New World, they brought the institutions of Europe with them. They set up a, a Portuguese bank, the Bank of Brazil. They set up the military training school, the naval training school, hospitals, all those things which uh, Brazil didn't have. And Portugal suddenly found itself having a, a, a ready-made empire which they built upon. Of course, uh, uh, he, King Juan VI was married to a very unpleasant woman named Juana Carlota, and, who was Spanish, but, uh, and conspired to try to make Brazil a, a colonial, a part of the Spanish empire. They didn't succeed, and, when he, and, and then when the Portuguese got free of Napoleon, and the British set up a, a sort of a junta there. They invited the king back, and the king said, "Next year, next year," because he didn't. He was enjoying himself so thoroughly in Brazil. Brazil is a thoroughly enjoyable country, <laughs> and, you know. And and here the people seemed to love him in contrast to the Portuguese, who, who just tolerated him because he had been king. The the line had been the the the. Uh, uh, line of, of, of kinsmen for about 500 years, and uh, finally in 1822, uh, 
he decided, okay, you'll go back because they said, if you don't come back now, don't ever come back. We'll set up our own government. He left, and he left his son in Brazil. Said, look, if there's a revolution, and there will be, please, I want you to take the reins of Brazil on your shoulders rather than on a usurper like is happening in many of the other Latin American countries. And so the Brazil declared itself independent from Portugal in 1842 and uh, has remained so since. Uh, yes. All right. I just, I think you got me going on this. <laughs> That was exactly what I was hoping you would do, but uh, now I th would like to skip forward about 150 years. And uh, what do you think of the present government uh, in Brazil? Is it uh, stable? Is it unstable? Uh, what are the immediate prospects? Oh boy, <laughs> clouded crystal ball here. Uh, uh, well, the present government of Brazil is fighting for its life. I mean, it's a, um, there's a lot of unrest in Brazil at the present moment, and a lot of dissatisfaction with the present government of Brazil. Um, Dilma is not a charismatic president. She is just plodding along and she's trying to keep afloat, and, and again, a lot of protest. But the protest in Brazil is mostly in southern Brazil. That's the developed part of Brazil. There's a vast gap between southern Brazil and northern Brazil. The majority, the modern Brazil is in, in the south. The people have become politicized. They, they really, in a way that we imagine ourselves to be politicized, but they are on political issues of the of the slightest nature, people co go into the streets now about educational policy, about the buses not running on time, about the hospitals not having good health, uh, you know, backup and all that, and they constantly protest in the streets. And this is a new development since the revolution of '88. That the military were thrown out of power. Uh, people have been very much vital. But I do, I do think that the traditions that Brazil has of a non-violent nature, of changing governments, they changed from a, a, a monarchy in, nine, uh, in 1888 to a, a democracy in 1891, and they have never had a violent revolution of any type and which people lost their lives, fought against the army. The army has never been on one side and the Brazilian people on the other. Is that in part what? Quite well, does anybody have any questions or uh, that they would like to ask at this point? Because, yes, sir. I would like to ask Dr. Young uh, about the rainforest. But like eighty percent of the rainforest is still there, but twenty percent has been usurped by development. Yeah, the question is to do with the rainforest, as we understand. I think both from the the book, the DVD, that eighty percent remains, but twenty percent is gone. How fast is it going? Can it be saved? Well, I had the the privilege. Of, I have worked up the Amazon River for about six months in nineteen forty three. And uh, let me tell you about that rainforest. It is so big that it is like, it is almost the size of the United States, that the, the rainforest itself and that part of northern Brazil contains just incredibly mild of acreage that you can't imagine. So when you say that 20% of the rainforest has been, has been eaten, eaten up, I would say yes, it's true, but it's so it has so much more to go. It has a, it has so many millions of miles that have never been touched. In Rondonio, which is the part on on the, in the where Brazil meets the Amazon, Brazil meets Bolivia, 
I was up there about three years ago, and I expected, they said, you know, people would say, the, the rainforest has been disappearing. So I, I was worried about whether, what it would be like to, to fly up into this area uh, called Rondonia. And I imagined all sorts of things, you know, that this was a rainforest. When I got there, you know, it was a suit. I was, I arrived at rush hour and the automobiles, I couldn't get across the street to the supermarket. And I realized that this was just a little nibble part of the Amazon that they've eaten up. And yet, yes, they have the boot cattle. They're, they're destroying that part of the Amazon for the cattle and the, um, what's the uh, commodity? Uh, Sorry. Sorry. Soybean. 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 They're doing a lot of soybean clearing. But I hope Brazil, will, you will keep the pressure up on Brazil to, to not, to prevent them from cutting even more of the Amazon because it's fragile. Once once the road goes through, then everything disappears, and you can't you can't sustain the rainforest on that. But it uh, got a lot to go. But I wish that it would stop. <laughs> yes. Before it, before the Portuguese came over and ruled Brazil, what about all the people that were there? Were there? Were there how many people were there in Brazil before the Portuguese got there? Is that a, that's a, a, a variation on the question. <laughs> Not many. There were. You see, Brazilian first thing, Brazilian Indians. That's the biggest problem. They uh, they were a small amount. And they're nomadic tribes. They're not like the Aztecs, the Incas, or the Mayas. There were no developed Indian civilizations. And the Portuguese met these people and intermarried with them because the Portuguese church was much more resilient and much more compromising than the Spanish church. They said, it's not right to get married with a heathen, but if you've got to, go ahead and get married. But And they did that with the Indians and with former slaves so that uh, well, in, in Brazil, you see, the, 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 there was really vacuums of population. Um, my wife's family comes from the Amazon area. She's from Belém. And there were, even when I was there in 1944, there was not very few people living in these Amazon tributaries. And her father was a manager of a Western Telegraph <coughs> a, a English firm. Uh, and would, would they just they didn't exist and so everywhere the Portuguese went they intermarried and uh, and spread and then the, the the Dutch had left their settlements there and the French had tried to invade Rio de Janeiro and failed and the English had tried to grab a piece all they could get was British Guiana up in the north which isn't worth a damn anyway so but uh, most of the time Brazil was able to take care of itself and, and incorporate these populations. Does that answer yes, your question? You. Yeah. Uh, any further questions? Yes, ma'am. I, I think I recall at the time of the World Cup some commentary about Brazil, and I thought I heard that there was a, a, a steady migration of people to from Africa and Europe coming to work in Brazil. Is that true? Is there a steady immigration of people from? Africa and Europe to Brazil, looking for opportunity. Yeah, most of, actually, uh, there's been a Brazil expatri expatriation in the other direction going to Africa. Uh, many, many Brazilians are now returning to Nigeria and, and along the coast of Africa. But in essence, Brazil has a thriving economy had a thriving economy in which they welcome Spaniards and and most of the foreign group are Spanish, not not Ita Italian were the first group, but they were the Italians were brought in about 1890 to replace the slaves. I mean, and they didn't work out in the in the coffee plantations. And then Japanese were brought in. They have the largest 
Japanese population outside of Japan it lives in Brazil today. And uh, you have a, a group of interesting uh, migrations, both Brazilians who have returned to Japan discovered they couldn't live in a tiny country like that and returned to Brazil. It's funny, the Brazilian uh, Japanese have become very Brazilianized and, and were very unadjusted when they went back to Brazil. But Brazil can take all that. They've got, uh, they've got open spaces, they've got land which is just unclaimed in the interior, and so everybody feels there's a chance to start a new world and start a, a new situation. Of course, you've got to balance that off with the fact that in the cities, there are, it's the black population which suffers the most. They're the lower, lowest of the income groups. There is, anybody who says there is no race prejudice in Brazil is lying because I used to say Brazilians were colorblind, but they're not. Brazil has race prejudice, but it works in a different way than the United States. They had no civil war. They, uh, the, they abolished slavery. They were the last country in the world to abolish slavery. They abolished it in 1888, and they compensated their, the, the owners of slaves. As a result, you have a mixed population up and down the coast. In the southern Brazil, it's mostly all white. But from in Bahia, Pernambuco, Recife, all these northern cities, there is a mixed population. But it seems to me there isn't any of that racial animosity. You don't feel anger in the lower income groups. You get it, whatever. Uh, there's crime, there, there, there is a lot of crime now because of the drugs, which is associated with black and white, it doesn't make any difference because people will be taking drugs no matter what color they are. And it, it, you, what I found it, is that you got along with most people and, and there was no, I, I don't know how to describe it, no, no push down on the, on the black population, no one saying you can't do this. There were no, uh, uh, you know, uh, white only for the toilets, white only for the drinking fountain. There's none of that. There was no, there was none of that in Brazil, and as a result, you have a better racial situation, which in turn translates itself to the workforce of Brazil. Yeah. Yes. Um, can you comment about uh, the role of Catholicism? in Brazil and differentiate it, if there is a differentiation, with the other countries surrounding it, and what do you think the trends are for the church down there, especially regarding population control? All right, All right. next two hours. <laughs> yeah. no. The role of Catholicism in Brazil, how does it differ from the role of Catholicism in other Latin American countries, and particularly, what was the third point? Uh, the third point was, what, uh, what influence does the church have on uh, human oh, yeah, population. population control? The yeah. church's role in Brazil on population control. Well, uh, Brazilian Catholicism is very different I, uh, from uh, Latin American Catholicism. Uh, there isn't any, uh, how, how, let me see, my wife, would, my wife was Catholic and so she would say, we listen to the Pope, but we don't pay any attention to him. <laughs> and, and, and you see, both, both Catholics in Brazil are like that. They, it's a very tolerant sort of Catholicism. And uh, it, it uh, is grown up in a, in a very quiet way. And as a result, there was a great deal of positivism in the Brazilian government in 1889. Even their flag has a positivistic statement order and progress, everybody laughs at that. Brazil is anything but orderly, so <laughs> maybe progress, but orderly not. And, and it's part of their government. It, it, they, everybody is supposed to be Catholic, yes, but, and they, yes, but, 
They, they just don't pay any attention to it. Now, what's happened in the last few years is American evangelicalism has been coming in strong. All of the ev evangelical Americans, the Seventh-day Adventists, and the, um, well, uh, every, every one of those Southern Baptist denominations have taken a foothold and are challenging Catholicism to a tremendous degree so that it is, it is proportionately lower the amount of Catholics. The, the, the impact of that is that these uh, evangelical religions are very conservative and run counter to the way the Catholics work and so that you're creating a sort of a, not a, I wouldn't say crisis situation, but one that you have to watch as it, as it develops because the religion will play a role in the city elections of Rio, Sao Paulo, and in, in Rio the, the, they have been uh, a, they have been winning because they present uh, more to their practitioners than do the, the, the Catholics. Now, was your question on politics? Again, the, the Catholic role in, in politics has been very interesting. They, in part, helped bring down the military dictatorship because the bishops favored the workers. The bishops gave, gave shelter to the workers. The bishops were the people who uh, fought against the military dictatorship. And uh, therefore, uh, were very well received by the people. Um, I don't think that uh, religion plays a role other than that in politics uh, in the contemporary situation in Brazil. Interesting. One of the things that I wanted to ask you about, uh, a lot of people speculated over the last few years that Brazil would be a disaster when the World Cup went, was played down there. Yeah. And lo and behold, God knows what it's done to the country's finances, but they seem to have gotten through it uh, without a disaster. And now everybody is speculating that just about a year from now, Brazil is going to be hosting the Olympics. Do you think they're going to be able to do that successfully? Well. <laughs> There certainly has been a revolution in Brazil. If you'd have told me that the people would have gone in the streets and said, we protest against the use of public money for stadiums, for soccer, for, for soccer I, I said, no, it's impossible because football was a part of the religion of Brazil. And, and you know, we watched Pelé, and Pelé was a god. I mean, he could do no wrong, and yet, they are protesting against the building of the stadiums the, the, uh, instead of you know, working on their infrastructure of, of, of transportation and hospitals and education. Uh, will Brazil in the Olympics? I, I think, I hope they will downplay the Olympics. Yes, they will, they will have everything ready for it. Um, uh, they, none of these Stadiums collapsed. You remember you and I chatted about. Uh, George said, D "I expect some of your stadiums are going to collapse," and they did not collapse tonight. Yeah, you were right. Uh, yeah. And and so Brazil will be ready for the Olympics, not in the in orderly fashion. It'll be a mess. Mm -hmm. It'll be last minute. And God, what do we do now? And transportation. What do we do? Now? And yet they'll make it. That the Brazilian have a way of improvising about. They call it Brazilian jeito, and they improvise about most things instead of a solid solution. <laughs> I have at least one uh, question, uh, too. I wanted to ask you to comment on U.S.-Brazilian relations. What did you think of the way they were characterized in the DVD and, and obviously your own comments on anything to do with past, present, or future? No. Uh, I think the movie handled it very well. I, I think that the United States has never taken Brazil seriously. 
it, it, you know, uh, Brazil never really had a communist, for the, for, for the country to be taken seriously, they had to have a communist threat. And they, would, they never did, and so Brazil was always just assumed to be an ally, a friendly ally. Brazilian forces, uh, not many people know this, uh, they, they fielded an army that helped the United States in the war, in World War II. The, the, the Brazilian Expeditionary Force went there and fought in World War II and came back and their veterans in part were, were got involved in politics, which was not good. But the Brazilian army in 1942 and 43 did capture a number of German regiments and it was a very amusing thing. It was the Fifth Army under uh, Mark Clark and these men I think it was near Monte Cassino, they captured a German regiment, a, a Panzer unit, and, and the Brazilians all of a sudden had five Br German generals under their control, and they didn't know what the hell to do with them. <laughs> and so they called up Mark Clark, and what do we do? We got these generals, and we've caught this, this German division, and they said, do what you want with them, I will have no part of it, you do it. And they did, and they, as a result, what did they do? Yeah, well, well they, they just captured it and, and imprisoned them and, and, and everything else. But it, it, and, and the Germans did not want us to, to, to surrender to these little Brazilians. They were running around <laughs> and said, okay, you, you guys are prisoners, and that's all there was to it. But, uh, oh, I'm sorry, what was the question? <laughs> I, I begin to enjoy myself oh, the, with these stories. <laughs> no, there was the, the role of Brazil in Brazilian-American yeah. relations. But, um, uh, yeah, we have some serious trade problems with Brazil, as we have with the rest of the world. Uh, I suspect it will be... I don't know, Dilma's, com uh, will, Dilma's coming to the United States again. She... Uh, I think Obama invited her and she has accepted. The Brazilians want to be taken seriously and it's, it's hard for the United States to take Brazil seriously. I remember de Gaulle in a visit to, to Brazil said, is this a serious country? I mean, he had some doubts about that and, and I think Washington still has doubts. But I, uh, they're, they're Manufacturing power, the commodities that they're developing, the the whole warp and weave of the United of Brazil demands that they be taken seriously, and I hope that our foreign service officers will be sent down who are better prepared because most of the time in Brazil we we select ambassadors who have contributed to the Democratic Party. And you know they they where, where, what's the capital of Brazil, Rio de Janeiro? And the guy will say, yeah, it's not it's Brazilian <laughs> and others. Uh, but I think that Brazilian relations and American relations will continue on a, on an even keel. It, Cuba might be a problem because Brazil respects Cuba. Brazil has a, taken a nice uh, a particular uh, friendly stand towards Cuba. And this is going to over overplay our relations with Venezuela also. It may change now yeah. that uh, the U.S. has, in effect, recognized the, the Cuban government. Um, I'm going to ask for that relation. Uh, the lady in the back. Uh, yeah. Jordan, what did Brazil get out of forming their whole capital and moving the whole thing to Brazil? What, what did they get out of it? Yeah, what why did, did they do that? Why did Brazil go to all the trouble and expense of moving that capital to the middle of the country where nobody was? Yeah. That's not quite what she said. <laughs> that was because the naval attack on, on a coastal city would be so great and dangerous that they decided to move it in land where nobody would touch it. And, and they were correct in that. And, and, and I remember, I, it, it's an amazing thing to see, a, 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 well, we built Washington, but 
the Brasilia was started from scratch in 1960. I went down there, and it's amazing to see this city built up all by these young Brazilians uh, under the age of 30. It opened up the country. The engineers were remarkable, and, and the, they flew in structural steel to build these buildings, and it is a very, one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. I'm prejudiced, but you, you should go down there and see their exceptionally open spaces and wide and wide cities. Uh, and it, it prevented them, Brazil has no enemies, that's the trouble with, you know, they really don't need their army. If they would, I just hope they could be like Costa Rica and say, we don't need an army, we might as well get rid of it because no one, no one threatens Brazil. It's like no one, no one, no one threatens the United States, no matter how much there's a lot of talk about. We, we, we are not under attack by a foreign country. So Brazil is, it, it, its borders are, it is secure. It, it, it does meddle in Brazilian, in Bolivian politics. But, you know, the Brazilians will, Brazilian military will say, we overthrow that government, but it, it, that's not the usual thing. Uruguay, Paraguay, they have all the countries which border on Brazil, and all of them are friendly, and they have taken friendly, uh, friendly position with them. All right, I think we've. I don't want to over yeah, I don't, overextend uh, Jordan here. So, is it any more questions? If not, I on behalf of you all, I will thank Jordan very much for this enlightening. <laughs> Thank you. I wish I could say professore in uh, Portuguese, but I can't. Professor Thank you, Professor. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, you all for coming. Okay. Good job.